once again we come to you in Jesus' name. And Lord, we just ask a special blessing on all these that we have discussed and all the restlessness that we haven't talked about. And Father, we just thank you so much for everything that you do in our lives every day. Lord, we just know that, uh, that you have a healing hand. And Lord, you, you can comfort those who need to comfort. And Lord, just ask that you be again with everyone on this list, Lord. Just, just be with them. Special prayer for the unsaved, Lord, that uh, we never know when our time is coming. We just pray that, that those who are unsaved will, will return to you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Um, so, as, as we move toward our Bible study time tonight, I thought we would... Uh, sing a, a worship chorus um, that really says a whole lot in a, in a very simple way. The name of the song is God Will Make a Way. You ever heard that one? God Will Make a Way. So let's stand together and, and sing that um, sing that song, that chorus together. God Will Make a Way. good to know that God not only will make a way, he's already told us the way that he's made. 
And so as we study the book of Revelation together, we see the way that he's already made. He's, he's laid it out right before us so that we, we don't have to be caught unaware. Jesus told the parable in the New Testament of uh, the ten virgins. And the, his point in telling this parable of the ten virgins was that some were not prepared. When the bridegroom came, when it was time to, to move forward to, with, with the, the wedding celebration and all that went with that, that moment in time when they should have been prepared, they were unprepared. And some got left behind. And so Jesus' point in all of that was, listen, there's going to come a day, a time, a moment in history that you do not want to miss. When Jesus comes again, you don't want to miss that. Now, there's going to be, as we've talked about, opportunities, even during this seven years of tribulation, for people in the world at that time to come to Christ. There's 144,000 witnesses we've talked about. They're going to be here to tell the world, you've got to turn to Christ. You've got to turn to Jesus. He's the only hope. They're going to be the two witnesses that we've talked about. And still so many millions will even, even at the witness of the, the two, two witnesses and the 144,000 will still not believe. So tonight, um, as we finish out chapter 13, um, we're going to talk about believers and unbelievers. But there's a twist to the terminology. So let's, let's look at Revelation chapter 13. And the first half of that chapter is about the beast from the sea. We've already identified as the Antichrist. The political ruler that's going to rise to power. A one world government kind of power under the influence of this individual who's called the beast. Who's risen from the sea. And there is, as we began to talk about last time we were together, the beast from the earth there beginning in verse 11 that is identified as the prophet uh, for the beast. So you have a political side to this one world government, but there's also going to be a religious side to that. Um, it's... In, in Old Testament terminology, we talk about a theocracy in Israel. A theocracy is when you have a, 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 a religious overriding influence on public political affairs. In Israel, how are they supposed to be governed? God is our king, our ruler. We're going to follow him. That's the way God gave his law to Moses to, to follow. But we know that as we follow along in their history, and they were surrounded by the pagan nations all around them that had earthly kings. And you got to the end of the period of the judges, and Samuel, the last of the judges and the prophet, and the people came complaining, we want a king, we want a king, we want a king. And he said, you've got a king. <laughs> you, you've got Yahweh, you've got God as your king. No, we need an earthly king. And so, and, and so even after that, you had um, the, the rule of, uh, of God's ordinances and principles of the word of God. The law of Moses was overriding supposed to be overriding in that nation. So it was a theocracy, theos, God in the Greek. And, um, and the, the rule of the people, like in a democracy, you know, we're like a, a nation that we're a, a republic democracy, like we have here, we have representatives and 
So that's why we're called a republic. We have representatives that go and, and represent us in a democratic kind of society. So that, that's the difference. Now, a holy theoc- theocracy would be like Israel of the Old Testament when God is, is king. But here in Revelation 13, we've talked about an unholy trinity. And, and, and so I, I would say an, an, unho- an unholy kind of theocracy. But in this case, the theos, the, the God that they're worshiping, is not the God of heaven, but is Satan himself, the dragon. So let's start there, verse 11, read through the end. And, and we've covered some of this ground last week, and we'll pick up. Um, on your outline on the back side of the page at D is where we'll pick up. But here we go. So verse 11, I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, had two horns like a lamb. And we talked about the fact that you know, horns having power, but, but a lamb uh, being kind of innocent. And so this, this uh, false prophet of the Antichrist is going to come across as, as innocent, a religious leader, well-respected. Um, but, but he's going to be given uh, uh, power to point people to uh, worship the Antichrist and ultimately worship the dragon. So let, let's keep, keep reading. So it, it, uh, it had uh, horns like a lamb, but spoke like what? A dragon. It's because it was speaking for um, the dragon, which is Satan. Verse 12 says, it, that is this beast, this false prophet, exercises all authority of the first beast, the Antichrist, on its behalf and compels the earth and those who live on the earth to worship the first beast, the Antichrist, whose fatal wound was healed. And so we talked about that last time. This um, uh, apparently, uh, you know, having maybe uh, an assassination attempt of some kind, whatever happens, we don't know for sure, but, and, but there's at least the imagery, if not the, the reality of, of trying to be like Jesus who died and rose again, the antichrist is is going to to mimic the real Christ. And so there's going going to be this death and this resurrection um, of the first beast. Verse 13 says, it also performed great signs even causing fire to come down from heaven to earth in front of the people. We talked about being like Elijah of the Old Testament. We talked about that last time. Um, Verse 14 says, It deceives those who live on the earth because of the signs that it is permitted to perform in the presence of the beast. That word permitted, um, uh, or, or some of your translation may say, you know, it was given the ability to perform. Um actually goes to the fact that God is still on his throne. None of this is happening and God's going, sitting there going, oh my goodness, I didn't see that coming. I mean, we understand that, right? God doesn't do plan B. There's only plan A with God. And so he's still in control, but he's allowing these things to happen on the earth as part of the judgment of the earth and the sin of the earth. Um, but also as a, hey, this is your last opportunity to come to Christ. So uh, it's permitted or he's given uh, permission to perform these, these uh, powers, these abilities. Uh, and it says he's telling those who live on the earth to make an image of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. So again, goes back to that possible assassination attempt. Verse 15, it was permitted, there's that word again, to to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast could both speak and cause whomever would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Verse 16, and it makes everyone small and great, rich and poor, free and slave to receive a mark on his right hand or on his forehead so that... No one can buy and sell unless he has the mark. The beast's name or the number of its name. uh, And this calls for wisdom, verse 18 says. Let 
Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, because it is the number of a person or man, it is the number 666. So we're going to get to the, the, the meat of some of that tonight. Now, I'm going to ask you one more time real quickly to pray with me. Father, bless now the reading of your word. Uh, we, we don't want it to return void. We want it to accomplish in our hearts, in our lives today, what you have for us. And uh, let it be a reminder to us that, uh, that Jesus is coming again. And we need to be prepared for that. And we want those around us to know him as Lord and Savior so that they would not suffer these incredibly tragic events that are going to fall upon the earth during this period of time that you have described, you've already laid out for us. So we, we thank you for laying this out before us tonight, um, that, that the world has no excuse there. You've already told us the things that will happen. So uh, help us to be faithful in, in our job to, to tell the good news that Jesus has come and, and provided everything that was necessary to have a relationship with you. So thank you, Lord Jesus. Uh, thank you for giving us your spirit. Help us to, to listen attentively to your spirit tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. So, last time we ended in verse 15 and we talked about uh, the image um, that was set up in the temple. Uh, at least that's where, I, that's where I left off uh, and that's what I marked on my face. Is that, are we right? Is that where we were? So, imagine... So let's just start right there for a second. So there's this image. What is that? There, you know, again, speculation about what does that mean? Uh, what is this image? Um, if you go back to the book of Daniel and you had King Nebuchadnezzar and King Nebuchadnezzar commanded a gigantic statue to be built, presumably in his own image, it probably looked like the face of Nebuchadnezzar and what were the people to do before that statue they were to gather around it and bow down before it and worship that statue in essence worshiping Nebuchadnezzar as a god um, of course Shadrach Meshach Abednego said no nah, we're, we're not going there and they end up in the fiery furnace but the cool thing about the fiery furnace was not not that it's cool i mean you see the little play on words there the cool thing about a fiery furnace was that there wasn't just three in there hey there's somebody else in there who looks like the son of god and so um so god came to the rescue of of, of shadrach meshach and abednego now the people during the tribulation are, are in a kind of fire like the world's never, ever known. And, um, and, and God is willing still, even at this point, to save them out of that if they'll only turn. But here's what happens. So the Antichrist is being lifted up by the false prophet, the second beast, as a god. And they build, they're going to build a statue of some kind, probably in his image, that maybe has his face, just like Nebuchadnezzar did in Babylon. But here's the difference. Somehow, miraculously, this statue is going to come to life. And it's going to, its mouth is going to start moving as if it's speaking. That's where it talks about breathing the breath of life into the image, into the statue. So somehow this statue is going to speak audibly. And, and, and people are going to be amazed by that. That this inanimate object all of a sudden is moving its mouth and speaking. And, and what it's going to speak is blasphemy. It's just going to, it's going to be uh, probably some, some word of, you know, everybody on the face of the earth, you know, has to bow down, you know, right now uh, to the Antichrist. Probably won't call him Antichrist by that name. 
we'll be calling him whatever his name is. We don't know because we don't know who it is yet, right? But there's going to be some kind of instruction that comes to, and, and, and just imagine there's going to be cameras, light camera action, right? There are going to be cameras from all over the world is going to capture this, and it's going to be on the internet, it's going to be on every TV screen, it's going to be everybody in the world will, will know this stuff's going on. And so that's the deception of it. So um, it, uh, this, this power is given and, and to this image in verse 15 to, to have breath. And, and the image of the beast uh, can speak. And it's going to cause those who would not worship the image to be killed. In other words, probably what's going to come out of this, the mouth of this image this statue is going to be everybody who will not bow down deserves to die and that and so there's there's this death penalty that's going to ensue for anyone who won't bow down shadrach meshach and abednego and worship the idol you know don't know if there's going to be a fiery furnace involved in this one Probably not. It's probably just going to be, you know, we'll just line you up. But whatever that the case is, um, there's going to be a division on the earth between believers and unbelievers. So that's D for your outline. A division, this, this uh, false prophet is going to divide the earth between the believers and unbelievers. But here's the twist on that. And I'm just going to quote here from, um, from Barry Britt and his, um, his commentary on this section. He says, the term believers and unbelievers will take on a new meaning. Do we have that one on the screen there for us, Wesley? Have we found it yet? Have you got, did you find D? There we go. Nope, that's not it. Keep going. It's under part two. Did, did we not get part two on there? Part two didn't get loaded? Okay, well, my apologies. If part two didn't get loaded, then we'll just have to um, fill it in for ourselves. So on, on the back side, the at D at the top of the page, he divides the earth between believers and unbelievers. I'm just going to read through this next paragraph and fill in the blanks. So I read a moment ago, the term believers and unbelievers will take on a new meaning. So that's your next blank there, new. Believers will be those who worship the Antichrist. And unbelievers will be those who refuse. So the next blank is the word refuse. But instead choose to place their faith and worship in Jesus Christ alone as Lord and Savior. And then the final blank there in that paragraph, a mark, mark, M-A-R-K. A mark of distinction will be given to show the difference of allegiance. So what are we saying there? Right now, today, we talk about believers and unbelievers. A believer is one who has put their faith in Jesus. And unbelievers are those who don't. But when you get to the period of the tribulation, it's going, they're going to flip that. They're going to say, if you're a believer, that means you believe in the, the, the statue and the beast and, and you're going to take the mark. And if you refuse, you're an unbeliever and you're going to be killed. So that's what he means there by, you know, kind of twisting those two meanings, believer and unbeliever. So now let's, let's talk about this, this mark. Now, verse 16 says um, that this applies to everybody. The great, the small and the great, the rich and the poor, the free or the slave. In other words, it doesn't matter who you are on earth. You've got a choice to make. You take the mark or you don't. If you don't, there's consequences. You don't eat because you can't go buy food. 
you, you can't get gas for your car if there are, is still gas. You can't, you can't plug your car in. <laughs> you can't plug your electric car in to whatever outlet you need to. In other words, commerce, everything is going to depend on whether or not you have received this mark. Whatever it is, and we'll talk about it in just a minute. Now, it, it talks about having received the mark either in your hand or forehead. So, there's already technology in the world today because we do it every day with our animals. Right? You take your dog, your cat, your possum, whatever your, whatever your pet is to the vet, what are they going to do with it? They're going to put a chip so that they can, you know, Located it if it's lost, they can you know have information on it. So the technology is already there in animals, and every people are just going to be another animal. Isn't that what the world is is leading us to believe? And, and that goes to the sanctity of human life. Whenever I talk about the sanctity of life, I always have to interject in there. We're not just talking about the sanctity of life; we're talking about the sanctity of human life. Because there are those in the world today who would much rather save that baby well than a baby in the womb of a mother. And that breaks my heart that humanity, human life, has been not just said we're on an even scale, but even lowered, you know, to, to a place where we'd rather, you know, we'd rather save some, you know, species of, of, uh, what was that fish that they kept saying didn't exist and there was like three of them in the state of Alabama and then they found, well, oh yeah, there's like millions of them, really. <laughs> I can't remember what that was, but uh, what now? The, the sturgeon, yes. <laughs> I was like, we, we'd rather save, you know, this species of fish, but, but yeah, you know, you want to abort a baby, no problem. You know, most of these environmentalists just kind of fall into those categories and it's just... How can you not have a, a higher view of human life? Well, because human life is causing all the problems on the earth. Well, yeah, because it's called sin and we live in a fallen world, but God did something about that. So anyway, I digress. But, but that's the way it is in, in the time of tribulation. Humanity is just another animal. Just another animal. And this world is already moving in that direction. Just another mammal. And so, the, uh, the next paragraph in your outline, this infamous mark of the beast. That's your, that's your words you want to fill in, that blank. Mark of the beast. Will be a death sentence. For believers in Jesus, although at that time they're going to be called unbelievers because they're not believing in the, the Antichrist or refusing to take the mark, refu you know. Uh, and so true Christians will not receive the mark. And if you do not believe, or I'm sorry, if you do not receive the mark, you're, you're going to get no food, no gas, no electricity, no water, no service. You can't buy, you can't sell, you can't trade so obviously a, a bad situation for those who are who refuse to take the mark of the beast now next paragraph in your outline in the same way the mark of the beast allows its bearers to conduct their affairs it, it also indicates that the one wearing it is a worshiper so that's your next blank there worshiper of the beast who submits to his rule now that that quote comes from uh, David Jeremiah and I'm going to read in just a just a second I'm going to read from uh, David Jeremiah on this issue of the, this mark of the beast and the 666 and what it means. I want to share that with you. Um, so let's just go ahead and, and talk about that issue. Um, 
Warren Worsby, and I've quoted several times throughout this study uh, from his, um, his work on, on this issue, he puts it this way. Um, so, since man was created on the sixth day, six is the number of man. So, that's your next blank, the number of man, M-A-N. You could say mankind, humanity, but that's what it means. It's not, it's not man like masculine, it's, it's, it's all of humanity. Man and woman, boy and girl, but it's called the number of man. Creation was made for man and likewise has the number six stamped on it. But seven is the number of perfection. So that's your next blank. The word is perfection and fullness. Another word for fullness is completeness. But just going with the quote from Warren Worsby, the word there is fullness. So seven is the number of perfection and fullness, but six is the, num is the human number just short of perfection. Now, I want to share with you from uh, Dr. David, David Jeremiah in uh, a section to help us wrap our minds around what, it, what does this 666 mean? And it talks about, you know, calculate it. It's almost as if, hey, go figure this out. Um, and, and we're still scratching our head trying to figure this out. So this, this comes from uh, Agents of the Apocalypse, uh, David Jeremiah. And, and here's what he says about this whole scene. Uh, he's relating it back to um, the, the time uh, during World War II where, where things were rationed. You know, you couldn't just go and get whatever you wanted at the store. You had to you know, you, you had to stand in line to get the rations that were given out. So that, that's where he starts here. During World War II, money alone was not enough to buy sugar and certain other staples in the United States. People also had to use their food stamps or have a card that allowed them to purchase various items. Certain commodities were rationed and could not be bought without authorization. This is only a shadow of how it will be in the tribulation. When people go to buy food, they will be asked to show their cards or perhaps present their right hand or their foreheads to be scanned. Only then will they be permitted to purchase what they need. While no one can say for certain what the mark of the beast will be, Revelation 13, 18 gives us an enigmatic clue. Here is wisdom. Let him who understands or has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of man. His number is 666. There have been countless theories about the meaning of the number 666 over the centuries. People have scoured scripture for clues, trying to find significance in merely coincidental facts. For instance, the number appears in the 18th verse of Revelation 13. And by the way, this is one of the things that drives me insane in the numerology stuff that floats around about those who try to study the scriptures and they're pulling, well, this number and that number. Well, this is you know, this is what it says in, in such and such a chapter and verse, and, and, and see it's verse 3, and 3 means trinity. And it, it's like, people, when Scripture was written, there were no chapters and verses. That's just pure speculation, and that, that's what David Jeremiah is saying here. So bear, bear that in mind. So he says, so because it's in Revelation 13, and and, and, and verse 18, and 18 is 6 plus 6 plus 6. Ah, I'm like, that kind of stuff drives me insane, but people do it. And, and he says, one of the largest 
men who ever lived was Goliath. He was six cubits tall. The head of his spear was 600 shekels. He had six pieces of armor. That's from 1 Samuel chapter, four, chapter 17. Okay, here's another one. Nebuchadnezzar, his stature in the book of Daniel was 60 cubits tall, six cubits wide, and six musical instruments summoned the worshipers. Okay, Daniel chapter 3. Now here's another one. Uh, or, or I'm sorry, he just goes on to say, such, such observations have been used to pin the label Antichrist on almost every prominent leader from the Pope to Hitler to even American presidents. If people try hard enough, they can find a way to manipulate almost any name to fit that number. Such attempts, however, are merely contrivances. They tell us nothing about the meaning of the number of the beast. The bottom line is that no one really knows what 666 means. There it is. So if you, if you were hoping I was going to tell you tonight, I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry. We're still scratching our head going, okay. But we're going to talk about in that time, um, something's going to give it away. We don't know what it is, but I, I, I'll bring that up in a minute. So, so uh, Dr. Jeremiah goes on to say this, God's number, no, let me back up. Perhaps the most likely answer is that in the Bible, six is the number for human beings. People were created on the sixth day. They're to work, they are to work six of the seven days. A Hebrew could not be a slave for more than six years. It's just, you know, a lot of things that go to the Six being the number of man. God's number, on the other hand, is seven. He created seven days in a week. There are seven colors in the visible spectrum. Uh, seven notes in a musical scale. Biblically, there are seven feasts of Jehovah, according to Le Leviticus chapter 23. There are seven sayings of Jesus from the cross. There are seven secrets of the kingdom parables in Matthew 13. At the fall of Jericho, seven priests marched in front of the army bearing seven trumpets of ram's horns. And on the seventh day, they marched around the city seven times. In the book of Revelation, which is more properly titled the Revelation of Jesus Christ, the number seven is used more than 50 times. There are seven churches, seven spirits, capital S, because it's referring to the Holy Spirit. Seven candlesticks, seven stars, seven lamps, seven seals, seven horns, seven eyes, seven trumpets, seven thunders, seven heads, seven crowns, seven angels, seven plagues, seven bowls, seven mountains, seven kings, seven beatitudes, seven years of judgment, seven letters to the seven churches, seven I am statements of Christ, and seven songs in heaven. Seven is God's number, the number of completeness. But six is the number for humans, the number of incompleteness. Perhaps this is the meaning of 666, that human beings, e even to the triple, fall short of God's perfection. In, on our own, we are incomplete, and we long for fulfillment in the perfect completeness of God. Then he goes on to tell a story about one of the great preachers of, uh, of decades ago, uh, Donald Gray Barnhouse. Um, I've got some commentaries on my, my shelf that were from Barnhouse. In fact, Barnhouse wrote a very famous commentary on the book of Revelation. But anyway, so he says, Donald Gray Barnhouse illustrates why the most important thing to know about the mark of the beast is not specifically who it represents, but what it should arouse in us. And here's the story that Barnhouse tells. He says, the children of the great composer Bach found that the easiest method of waking their father was to play a few lines of music and leave off the last note. 
the musician, Bach, would arise immediately and go to his piano and strike that last chord. Then Barnhouse writes, he says, I awoke early one morning and went to the piano in our home and played the well-known carol, Silent Night. I purposefully stopped just before playing the last note. And I walked out into the hallway and I listened to the sound that came from upstairs. An eight-year-old who stopped his reading and was trying to sound out the final note on his harmonica. Another child was singing that last note lustily. An adult called down, did you do that purposefully? What is the matter? Our very nature demands the completion of the octave. So now back to um, David Jeremiah. So the number 666 reminds us that there's something missing. That missing something is a someone. He is a seven. The mark of perfection. The complete number. So that quote is is in your outline. The number 666 reminds us that there is something missing. That should be your next blank, the word missing. That missing something is a someone with a capital S because he's a seven, the mark of perfection, the complete number. Now, I'm going, go, I'm going to jump back to Warren Worsby and his commentary on this text. In the next paragraph in your outline, it should read like this. Despite all of man's imaginative calculations, we must confess that no one, that's two words, no one knows the meaning of this number and name. But here's the thing, no doubt believers on the earth at that time will understand it completely or clearly. There's going to be something that's going to be the, the giveaway. And, and those who have, are, are placing their faith in Jesus... Because of the witness of the 144,000, the two witnesses, whatever the case is, and they're, they're lost because they weren't in the rapture, but now they're coming to Christ and saying, no, I'm, I'm going to put my faith in Jesus. They're going to, something's going to tip them off. Don't take that mark. Not in your hand, not in your forehead. Don't do it. And... So whatever it is, they will know. We don't know today, but there's going to be something that's going to, that's going to help them know and understand that, no, well, I'm, I'm not taking that. It's going to be costly to them. So the last paragraph to, to kind of wrap this up and help us put all the pieces of this together. Um. There are many beliefs about what the number means or will be. The truth is that we will not know until it happens. And then when it does, it will make perfect sense. So that's your next fill in the blank. It will make perfect sense. The only way to be made complete is by receiving by grace through faith the salvation of of God providing through provided through Jesus Christ we can be made complete when we realize that because of our sin that's your next blank we are incomplete that's your next blank after that and separated from God because of our sin we are incomplete and separated from God Jesus Christ fully so there, there's that completeness, right? 
We are incomplete because of our sin. And Jesus completely and fully paid our sin debt when he gave his life as a sacrifice on the cross and shed his innocent and holy blood. He rose from the dead, proving that he paid our debt completely and invites us all to be made right with him or through him. Don't wait until it's too late. There's, that's the warning in all of this, right? Don't wait. Don't be deceived by Satan and his lies and deceit. That word should be give. A little typo there. Give your life to Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord today. So, I'm glad I answered all of your questions about 666 tonight because I don't know. Okay, so what question do you have? Yeah. He got shot in an error and died. And you said that it was a statue. So how did he die? No, no, no. So what happens is there is a, the human, the Antichrist, and um, he, you know, whether it's an assassination attempt or whatever it is, and he's he comes back to life. But like King Nebuchadnezzar was a human being, but they built a statue in his image. So the, the, uh, the false prophet is going to have a statue built in the temple at Jerusalem. And that's the, uh, that's the abomination, the desecration. Uh, oh, yeah, he'll go because it's like, hey, here I am, and here's my statue. And they're going to build the statue of the temple mount in what's supposed to be the holy place. Um, this statue apparently is going to be erected there. And that's the uh, desecration of the temple. You're, you're using what should be the temple that was, you know, Solomon's temple that was eventually destroyed. And then uh, uh, Ezra came along after the seven years to rebuild the temple. And it got destroyed again. Um, and, and then Herod came along and he had, you, then you had Herod's temple. That was the temple that was standing when Jesus um, was in, um, you know, on the earth. Um, and then in 70 AD, it got destroyed. And now there's only the Wailing Wall that was the only, only thing left of it. And on that Temple Mount, of course, now sits the Dome of the Rock. But apparently sometime between the beginning of the tribulation period and this three and a half year mark, they will have built a, a new temple in, in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount. Um, you said the mark, you know, they were warned about the mark and three and a half, well, after witnesses come, and they come three and a half years after it starts, right? So um, you're not going to be able to get the mark until, is that when it starts, you get the mark? So here we are at the middle point. We're at that three and a half. Right. So the the, the 144,000 have been there the first three and a half years, you know, warning everybody um, and telling everybody you need to come to Christ because all the, all, you know, the, the tragic things that are happening on the earth, um, the things that we've already read about and some that we haven't even yet gotten to, um, the um, hell fire, the, um, the, the waters being poisoned, all of that is, is already starting to happen in that first three and a half years. It only gets worse after that because there's another round that's even worse that comes. So, so yeah, they, uh, up until this point, they, they have had the, the 144,000 and then the, the, the two witnesses come on the scene and then the Antichrist uh, and the, um, the false prophet are going to have them killed. And drug through the streets, the, the two witnesses. So, um, so that's that's what's about to happen. We, you know, in the timeline. Uh, you can buy food and all that up until that point. Well, apparently, the, the, this Mormon beast that issue that happened to that middle point. 
right at the, at the beginning of all of it. Yeah. And, you know, th- there are different opinions, you know, where kind of where it falls in the timeline. But, you know, whether it was earlier, you know, at the very beginning, it's possible. Um, because the Antichrist has to have come to power, you know, by that beginning time. Or he's coming to power at, at the very beginning of the, the tribulation, the seven years. So that's why I believe he, he, he's building his coalition during the first three and a half years. He's making peace with Israel. And he said, oh, we'll build you a new temple. And that's where the religious part of it comes in. And so it takes some time to do all of that. And you get to this middle point, And now he's, he's built the temple. And they say, oh, by the way, um, we're going to erect this statue. And everybody needs to bow down to it. Because in, in bowing down to it, like Nebuchadnezzar, they're bowing down to Antichrist. And ultimately, they're bowing down to the dragon. Because he's the one who is powering, you know, all of this. In this, in this tribulation? The what now? The Bible? Oh, yeah. Well, why don't the Christians know that what's coming, they can put that faith in Jesus. Christ and start stockpiling stuff. You know, has anybody heard of the market of base? They're not going to pay. Has anybody heard of the Gideon ministry? What are Gideons doing all around the world? Where, where are they putting these Bibles? In churches? No, hotel rooms, hospital rooms, all over the earth. When all this happens, that's why people are going to be able to get saved. Because not only they have the witness of the 144,000 and the two witnesses, there's going to be a Bible sitting in that drawer at the hotel room. Hey, I, I remember somebody had a Bible. So who's got it? You know, they're going to be running back to Grandma's house, digging around. Where was Grandma's Bible? I remember Grandma said something about all this, and it, it, it's not good. And, and so people are going. In fact, um, I want to say that somebody who, who preached on this, it it was uh, it may have been David Jeremiah who's doing this, but I want to say um, Tony Evans maybe too. They are making like CDs or, or DVDs or or some like video recordings of it might be Tony Evans. I just wish I could remember exactly who it is, and and, and getting them out there to where when all of this comes down, uh, somebody's gonna say, "Hey, I remember seeing a video about this," and you know, pop that in. And he, you're going to get the, the gospel is going to be preached right there. Hey, listen, you missed the rapture, but there's still hope. And you better put your faith in Jesus Christ right now. And by the way, some bad things are about to happen if you do. But if you don't, you're going to miss eternity with Christ. So all of that, to answer your question, is already taking place. But it's like Jesus said. Um, you remember when he, you know, he told the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. So they both die, the rich man and this slave, Lazarus, uh, poor man. He's, Lazarus goes to, to, in the bosom of Abraham and, and the rich man goes to Hades. And, and what, well, it's Hades all together, but there's a dividing line. There's the great gulf that's fixed between the two. We don't have time to get into all that theology, okay? But the point is, so the rich man says, hey, um, you know, I'm, I'm suffering here. Just give me a drop of water on my tongue, and that will at least ease some of the suffering. It's like, eh, I can't do it. <laughs> There's this great gulf fix between us. Well, if you can't do it for me, then send somebody back to tell. Send Lazarus back. Tell my brothers so they don't have to. And, and you know what Jesus said, or in the parable, what was said to that was, you know what? That would be a great idea, but. They've already got the prophets and Moses. And if they don't believe the prophets and Moses, they won't believe even if the dead were raised again. And that was also a foreshadowing of Jesus because he was going to die and and be raised from the dead and still people won't believe. So, you know, we, we do what we can to get the gospel out there. And, you know, they're 
At the end of the day, there's still going to be those who refuse to turn to Christ. But that, that's not our concern. Our concern is to, to not come empty-handed. Have you ever thought, I mean, just for a minute, Jesus compared the world to a field. Remember, he said, the, fi- the fields are white unto harvest. Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. What's the imagery there? The laborers go out in that harvest with their baskets to gather, right? And then you, what you gather, you bring back in and you turn that in. That's, that's the harvest. That's the fruit of the, of the harvest. Can you imagine standing before Jesus? Here's my basket, Lord. I don't see anything in there. I, I just, I can't personally imagine having lived my entire life as a Christian and not ever having won somebody to Jesus Christ. Somebody. Even if, it, even if I got to Jesus and said, I, got, I don't have much in my basket, I got one. See, scripture says one day we will stand before him and give an account, an accounting of our Christian life. It's... It's a judgment seat. It's not the great white throne where he's going to cast the, the unbelievers into you know, eternal lake of fire. But there is a judgment that will judge, that he will judge our fruit or lack thereof. And I sure don't want to ever stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and say, I'm glad I made it by the skin of my teeth. Don't have anything in my basket, but here I am, Lord. But that's, that's the sad case of most Christians coming before Jesus empty-handed. I don't think it's the way he intended for us to, to come. And yeah, that, that cuts. And that stomps on our toes. And, and the devil will say, yeah, you... If you make it by the skin of your teeth, then you're, you're doing good. And Jesus is saying, I've given you my Holy Spirit. I've given you every tool in, in the tool belt. I've given you all I can give you. Just bring somebody with you. Somebody. It's convicting. But that's the reality of what the New Testament tells us. As believers in Jesus, um, the fields are white in the harvest. Um, and we just need to, maybe we just need to pray over that. Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Father, we are always convicted when it comes to your commands about. Going and making disciples, the Great Commission, all those things, you know, being fishers of men, the things that you called your, your followers to be. Because we look at our lives and, and we, then we think, you know, I've, we may not have been much of a witness. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to start afresh, to start anew today, tomorrow is a new day, a new opportunity, unless you come again to tell the good news to somebody. Uh, one of our loved ones, that we wouldn't wish any of this uh, horrible uh, and, and tragic events of the tribulation for them to have to live through. Give us the courage to tell them maybe one more time that they need Jesus. And, and help us not be uh, fearful uh, of what somebody may say because we can't control that. But Lord, help us to be faithful 
to tell the good news so that we can present before you a basket full of fruit for your kingdom. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen.